be seated. Bless you. Look with me in Romans chapter 12. Let's talk about love your enemies. Romans chapter 12, beginning in verse 13. Paul says, share with the Lord's people who are in need. Practice hospitality. We'll talk about those words. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Mourn with those who mourn. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be proud, but be willing to associate with people of low position. Do not be conceited. Look at verse 17. Do not repay evil for evil. <clears throat> be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. If it, is po if it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Do not take revenge, my dear friends, but leave room for God's wrath, for it is written, it is mine to avenge, I will repay, says the Lord. On the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him something to drink. In doing this, you will heap burning coals on his head. We'll talk about the meaning of that. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Let's pray and invite the Holy Spirit to speak to us. Father, thank you for this morning. Thank you for your presence with us. Thank you for the people you love so much. Thank you for your powerful word. Your word is truth. Father, we pray that we would encounter you this morning as we receive the ministry of your word. If your heart agrees, would you say amen and amen. Uh, excuse me. You know what? There's a lot of construction dust that's left here in the sanctuary from the sheet rocking and gets a little caught in my throat all right well a priest got up one Sunday morning to deliver the homily and he read Jesus command love your enemies and then he took a little poll of his congregation he said how many of you out there have many enemies not surprisingly a, a lot of hands went up all over the sanctuary. He went on and he said, how many of you have a few enemies? About half the number of hands went up. He said, how many have just one or two enemies? And a sprinkle of hands went up. Finally, he asked, now raise your hand if you have no enemies. The priest looked around and way in the back, he saw one hand belonging to an elderly gentleman. Delighted, the priest asked the man to come to the front. He said, what a wonderful Christian example you are. How old are you, sir? The man answered, Father, I am 98 years old, and I have no enemies. The priest said, please, tell us all, what is the secret to having no enemies? The man smiled, and he said, all the bums are dead. <laughs> Today I want to share with you what I believe is the single most difficult thing in the entire Christian life. It's more difficult than overcoming habitual sin. It's more difficult than learning how to tithe and trust God with your finances. It's harder than enduring suffering. It's even harder, I think, than reconciling the loss of a loved one. It's loving our enemies. In Romans 12... Paul quotes Jesus more closely than anywhere else in all of his letters. In the beautiful Sermon on the Mount, Jesus said, You have heard it said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy, but I say to you, love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you, that you might be children of your Father in heaven. In the parallel passage in Luke 6, Jesus upped the ante even more. He said, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, bless those who curse you, pray for those who mistreat you. If you love those who love you, what good is that? Even sinners love those who love them, but love your enemies, do good to them. Then your reward will be great and you will be children of the Most High because he is kind to the ungrateful and wicked. He is merciful. 
Beloved, when Jesus commanded us to love our enemies, he wasn't just putting warm fuzzies out there. He wasn't just giving us lofty ideals. He didn't say to himself, well, I'll set the bar really high, and even though they'll never reach it, it'll give them something to shoot for. No, when Jesus commands us to love our enemies, to pray for them, to bless them, to do good to them, he actually means it. Jesus is revealing the will of the Father for every child of the kingdom. You remember Jesus said, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, only the one who who does the will of my Father. And part of doing the Father's will is loving my enemies. In Romans 12, Paul echoes Jesus' command to love our enemies in that very same context. It's in the context of doing the will of our Father. If it is God's will for us to love our enemies, that means it is not an impossible task in Christ. If God told us to do it, then he must also provide us with everything we need to actually do it. In Romans chapter 12, Paul describes the transformed mind of believers in Christ. He, he says that the transformed Christian mind is characterized by love. He tells us first in Romans 12 how we should love our fellow Christians and then he tells us how we should love non-Christians, even anti-Christians who persecute us because of our faith in Christ. Looking at Paul's words, I want to share with you for a few minutes about why we should love our enemies and then how we can love them. Why should we love our enemies? And how can we do it? I want to share with you four whys and three hows. Love your enemies. Four whys and three hows. The first why is this. Why should I love my enemies? Because it is imitating my Father in heaven. Now, we have some screens like the, like the ones in the other sanctuary. They're on the way to us. They're promised to us for July 1st. So we're praying that they keep that promise. In the meantime, we're muddling through. We don't have the, the benefit of the screens this morning, but we printed for you a sermon outline. You might have received it on your way in in the door, and you can follow along if you like and fill in the blanks. Why should I love my enemies? First of all, because it is imitating my Father in heaven. <clears throat> During his earthly ministry, Jesus taught a spiritual principle. Children resemble their spiritual father. To the Pharisees who were conspiring to kill him, Jesus said, you know, you're acting just like your father, the devil. He was a murderer from the beginning, and lying is his native tongue. Children look like their spiritual father. To the disciples, Jesus said, when you love your enemies, you show that you belong to your Father in heaven, for he is kind to the ungrateful and wicked. As followers of Jesus, we have a whole new mission in life. Our mission is to testify of a God in heaven that is unlike any other God worshipped anywhere in the world, a God who loves his enemies. Men are always looking for proof that God exists. Actually, proof is everywhere. All of creation is proof that God exists. The uniqueness of mankind in the midst of creation is proof. Human history, especially the history of the Jewish people, is proof. The Bible is proof. The church is proof. And Christians are proof that God exists. Earlier in Romans, Paul wrote, but God demonstrated his love for us in this. That while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. While we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son. Jesus said the world only knows 
one kind of love. It's love for friends and family and animosity towards foes. But when we love our enemies, we testify that another kind of love has come into the world. A higher love, a purer love, a selfless love, a forgiving love. When we love our enemies, we testify that we have become recipients of his love and love has changed us. When we love our enemies, we not only offer the world proof that God exists, but we testify that he is unlike anyone or anything else. Love your enemies, four whys and three hows. Why should I love my enemies? Second, because it's following Jesus in the crucified life. It's following Jesus in the crucified life. Jesus said, if anyone wants to be my disciple, he must deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. You know, the world says, express yourself. But Jesus said, deny yourself. The world says, be true to yourself. But Jesus said, deny yourself. The world says, suit yourself, please yourself. But Jesus says, deny yourself. Loving our enemies requires us to die to self and to follow Jesus in living the crucified life. Loving our enemies requires us to lay down our pride. It requires us to lay down our dignity at times. It requires us to lay down our rights. When we love our enemies, we show that we are disciples of the one who laid down his life for his enemies. And beloved, that's not just some abstract idea. Jesus actually did this for you and for me. You see, when I love my enemies, I remind myself that once I was just as alienated from God as my enemies are alienated from me. I was once just as distant from God as my enemies are distant from me. I was wants just as much an affront to God as my enemies are an affront to me. I was once opposed to God just as much as my enemies are opposed to me. Although the fault was all mine, God took the initiative to reach out to me. God took the burden on himself to make peace. He took the hurt on himself. When we love our enemies, we testify that we ourselves have become recipients of great mercy. We testify that we are debtors to grace. We testify that God has rescued us and we belong to him now. Jesus said, this is how all people will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. Love your enemies, four whys and three hows. Why should I love my enemy? Number one, because it's imitating my father. Number two, because it's following Jesus in the crucified life. Number three, why should I love my enemies? Because God will use my obedience to reconcile some of my enemies to himself. God will use my obedience to reconcile some of my enemies to himself. In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus said, light, let your light shine before all men so that they will see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. Jesus went on to teach that letting our light shine includes loving our enemies. Peter wrote, keep a clear conscience so that those who speak maliciously against you may be ashamed of their slander. Paul says, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him something to drink. In doing this, you will heap burning coals on his head. There's been a lot of discussion about the meaning of that, but most agree that what it means is that your enemy will have a red face because of your kindness. He'll feel ashamed about his conduct and come under conviction and run to Christ. When we read Paul's words here, 
we have to remember that this is not merely theory for Paul. This was very personal. You, you see, Paul had been on both sides of this equation. He was once a fierce persecutor of the church. Saul of Tarsus held the jackets of the men who stoned Stephen mercilessly to death. He, he was a fierce persecutor of the church. He, he heard Stephen's prayer of intercession, Father, forgive them. In fact, the fruit of Stephen's prayers was Saul's conversion on the Damascus Road. But later on, Paul the apostle was beaten and whipped and falsely accused and falsely imprisoned. At Lystra, he was stoned and left for dead. And after the new believers prayed for him, he got up and he went right back into the city and kept on preaching Jesus. Paul was on, on both sides of this love your enemy equation. He, he was once the enemy who was loved to life by a believer. And then he became a believer who was persecuted and who prayed for his enemies. Paul could say from experience, this really does work, that God really does use the love of believers for their enemies to reconcile some of them to himself. Love your enemies, four wise and three hows. Why should I love my enemy? Number one, it's imitating my Father in heaven. Number two, it's following Jesus in the crucified life. Number three, God will use my obedience to reconcile some to himself. And fourth, why should I love my enemies? Because my faith grows in the process. You see, as I love my enemies, my faith in God's mercy grows. And also, my faith in his justice grows grows. Loving my enemies testifies that eternal outcomes mean more to me than temporary earthly satisfaction. Jesus said, don't be afraid of those who can kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Rather, be afraid of the one, that is God, who can kill both body and soul in hell. In other words, it is better to fear God than to get revenge among men. Hebrews says, remember the days when you endured great conflict, full of suffering. This is Hebrews chapter 10. Sometimes you were publicly exposed to insult and persecution. You accepted the confiscation of your property because you knew that, that you yourselves had better and lasting possessions. So don't throw away your confidence. It will be richly rewarded for in just a little while, he who is coming will come and will not delay. You see, by refusing to take matters into my own hands, I defer to God's justice. Elsewhere in Romans, Paul teaches that God uses human authorities to administer justice on earth. God uses government to keep order in society and to punish wrongdoers. God uses nations to keep other nations in check and to sub subdue them when necessary. And as believers, we're, we're part of that whole system. We participate in that. L loving my enemies means that I do forgive them from my heart, but it means that I also cooperate with the authorities if there's been criminal activity. It was right for the Allies to stop Hitler. And it was right for every Christian soldier to participate in God's administration of justice through human government. This weekend, we remember and we honor those who paid the ultimate price for the cause of justice. But beloved, listen, listen, look at me, look at, look, look at me, look at me. When this life is over, every one of us will stand before God and will give an account of our lives and God will administer perfect justice. 
You see, that means we can keep calm about our enemies. We don't have to wring our hands. We don't have to fret over what it is that they're doing. God sees everything. Hebrews says nothing, nothing is hidden from the eyes of the one to whom we must all give an account. But I would listen to me. Don't let the daily headlines unsettle you. Don't let them make you anxious or angry. God sees everything. God knows every secret of the NSA and the CIA and the FBI. He knows every past and present secret of the White House and the Kremlin and the Pentagon and Capitol Hill and the J. Edgar Hoover building. God knows every hack, every wiretap, every leaker. And God will hold every wrongdoer accountable. Everybody look at me. You see, knowing that God will administer perfect justice liberates me to love my enemy. The biggest obstacle to me loving my enemy is that my sense of justice has been violated and I can't rest until it's put right. That is actually a God-given instinct. But when I know that justice is in God's hands and I know that God won't miss, I can relax and love my enemy. One way or the other, we will always triumph over our enemies if we love them and we refuse to retaliate against them. God might work through our obedience and convict our enemies and they might repent of their sins and believe on Jesus and then the penalty that was paid on the cross will be applied to them just like it's been applied to you and to me. Otherwise, God will administer perfect justice on that great and final day when we all stand before him and God's justice is perfectly fair. If I try to settle the score and get back at my enemy, I can't do it objectively, but God is able to perfectly administer the punishment that fits the crime. Love your enemies. We shared four whys. Now let me share with you quickly three hows. How can I love my enemy? First of all, I can love my enemy by praying for them. Echoing the words of Jesus Paul says, bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse them. Jesus added to that, pray for those who persecute you. How do we bless our enemies? Well, in this context, Jesus is clear that it's something we do with our mouth. I find two forms that blessing may take. First of all, blessing is how we speak about our enemies whether it's to ourselves or whether it's to others, Jesus said, bless and do not curse. Beloved, I want to tell you that it's time for lovers of Jesus to get off the name-calling merry-go-round that has overtaken this society. You know, I know that our country has faced troubled times in the past, but honestly, in my lifetime, I cannot remember another time when there is so much rancor in the public discourse. Listen, calling your opponent a bigot is not blessing him. Racist or homophobe or xenophobe or misogynist or fascist. Neither is calling your opponent a snowflake or triggered. Jesus said, bless and do not curse. Paul wrote, love is patient. Love is kind. Love doesn't speak boastfully, neither does it dishonor others. It always believes the best. It always hopes for the best. Love never gives up. Let's make sure that we don't participate in today's name-calling game, either in our heads or in our conversations, or in what we put on social media. Blessing is how we speak about others, and blessing is also speaking to God about our enemies. You know, I, I'm pretty much convinced that, that 
we don't know how powerful our prayers are. Abraham interceded for the city of Sodom. He begged God to look again, to see if there was any occasion that God could find to show mercy. And because Abraham prayed, God said, yes, Abraham, I'll look again. I'll look and see if I can find any occasion. After the children of Israel worshipped the golden calf, God was determined to wipe them out. He told Moses, get out of the way. I can't destroy them while you're standing between me and them. But when Moses interceded, God changed his mind. In the book of Ezekiel, God says, before I bring judgment on any people, I look for an intercessor to stand in the gap for them, and I'm astonished if I don't find one, for I take no delight in the death of the wicked. Beloved, our prayers, do you realize your prayers, your prayers have the power to change God's mind about people. Your prayers have the power to change people's destinies. Jesus said, pray for your enemies. Ask God to be merciful, just as he was merciful with you. Ask God to call them to salvation, just as he called you. Ask God to give them the very best of this life and then to give them eternal life afterwards. Don't rejoice when they fall into hardships. Mourn with those who mourn. Don't get angry when blessings fall on them. Celebrate with them. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Ask God to use you to be the one who points them to Christ. I love it in the book of Acts chapter 4 when the early church was threatened by the Jewish authorities. They went to prayer. They said, oh God, look at how they're threatening us. Now I would expect the next line out of their mouth to be, get them, God. Look at, look at what they're doing to us. Go get them. Send a lightning bolt, a good one. <laughs> but instead they prayed, stretch out your hand to heal and to perform signs and wonders through the name of your holy servant Jesus. In other words, this was their prayer. Their prayer wasn't, look at how they're threatening us, Lord. Look at how they're arresting us. Look at what they're doing. Get them. Their prayer was, Lord, release supernatural signs and wonders all over this place so that they too become believers in Jesus. On the cross, Jesus prayed for his enemies. Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Do you know it's impossible to stay, long, to stay angry very long at someone when you're praying for him or praying for her? As you pray for them, the compassion of God fills your heart. As you pray for them, God gives you holy insight into the spiritual chains that have them bound and, and why they are the way they are. Jesus said they hated me with an unreasonable hatred. <clears throat> All I came was to do good. All I came was to heal. All I came was to comfort the broken and they hated me with an unreasonable hatred. It, it, it didn't originate in their own hearts and minds. It came from the pit of hell. Jesus had insight, holy insight into what was moving his enemies and the forces that had them bound. While they were stoning Stephen, he prayed, Father, forgive them. While Paul was in prison, he prayed for his persecutors that they would surrender to Jesus. Did their prayers work? Well, when you get to heaven, why don't you go ask the dying thief on the cross if Jesus' prayers worked? How about we go find the Roman centurion who cried out at the foot of the cross, surely this man is the Son of God, and ask him if Jesus' prayers worked. 
How about we find Paul and ask him if Stephen's prayer as he drew his last breath, Father, forgive them. Why don't we ask Paul, did that prayer work, Paul? How about we ask the Philippian prison warden who fell down at Paul's feet and said, Sir, what must I do to be saved? How about we find some Praetorian guards who Paul witnessed to while he was chained to them? How about we find some members of Caesar's household who became believers in Jesus because Paul prayed for his enemies in a Roman prison? Beloved, listen to me. Their prayers for their enemies worked and our prayers for our enemies will work as well. Beloved, listen to me. This whole heaping coals on your enemy's head, this is a supernatural thing. This is not passivism as the word understands passivism. This is not stoicism as the world understands stoicism. This is something Holy Ghost supernatural when we obey the words of Jesus. God invades the hearts of people and enemies are turned to Jesus. That's good preaching right there. <laughs> love your enemies four whys in three hows. How can I love my enemies? Number one, by praying for them. Number two, by pulling back when I want to punch back. Echoing Jesus, Paul says, repay no one evil for evil. Be thoughtful about what is doing good in the sight of all men. As much as possible, as far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all men. Do not avenge yourselves, but defer to God's justice. How can I love my enemies? Sometimes it means just staying quiet and not saying anything. Can I tell you the truth? I was born a preacher. The hardest thing in the world for me is to just stay quiet and not say anything. You know how I became a, a, a pastor? When I was two and three years old, my grandfather, my grandfather Harvison said over me again and again, that boy's going to be a preacher. He didn't say it because I was holy. He said it because I wouldn't stop talking. <laughs> the hardest thing in the world for me is to stay quiet and not say anything. I have to say something. There's a lesson that I keep learning the hard way in life. And that is we don't have to swing at every pitch. We don't have to respond to every shot across our bow. We don't have to take the bait and get drawn into every argument and every raging controversy. How do I love my enemies? Sometimes just by shutting up. And when I do need to speak, I speak as thoughtfully and graciously as possible. Paul wrote to the Colossians, let your speech be always full of grace, seasoned with salt, so that you know that how to answer everyone. Now that doesn't mean that everyone's going to be satisfied with our diplomacy. Some people are just looking for a fight and they will find any opportunity to take offense at your words. They're just like their father, the devil. They cunningly twist your words around to infer that you said things you never said. You can't do anything about that. That's why Paul says, if it's possible, as far as it depends on you. How can I love my enemies? By letting it slide. If my enemies fail to be diplomatic or even when they're downright mean. Peter said when they hurled insults at Jesus, he didn't retaliate. When he suffered, he made no threats. Instead, he entrusted himself to the one who judges justly. You see, if, my retali if I retaliate, then my enemy has made me just like himself and he has triumphed. But if I love my enemies like Jesus did, then good triumphs over evil. Love your enemies, four whys and three hows. 
How can I love my enemies? Number one, by praying for them. Number two, by pulling back. And finally, how can I love my enemies? By pursuing those who are pursuing me to show them kindness. Worship team, you can come help me finish. In Greek, there's a little play on words that's lost in translation in verses 13 and 14 of Romans 12. Any of you who speak more than one language know that, that sometimes when you translate things over, they get lost a little bit. There's a little, there's a little play, there's a little pun, there's a little play on words that, that's lost in the English translation. In Romans 12, 13, Paul says, practice hospitality. The word is actually pursue, pursue hospitality. In other words, look for occasions to show hospitality. Don't just wait for an opportunity to present itself. You go looking for the occasion. You go looking for the opportunity to show hospitality. Romans 12, 13, pursue hospitality. Romans 12, 14, bless those who persecute you. Guess what the real Greek word is? The, the English translators translated it persecute, but the Greek word is pursue. So here's how Romans 12 verses 13 and 14 actually read, pursue hospitality, bless those who are pursuing you. Pursue opportunities to show kindness to those who are pursuing you to hurt you. If your enemy's hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him something to drink. In doing this, you will heap burning coals on his head. In other words, you, you'll make him feel ashamed in a good way. You'll bring him into godly conviction that leads to repentance. Don't be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. I have to tell you that for me, that's what pushes this whole love your enemies thing right over the top. You know, it's one thing for me to pray for my enemy. I can do that privately between me and God. It's one thing for me to bite my tongue and not say what I really feel like saying. It's quite another thing for me to go look for opportunities to show my enemy kindness. It's quite another thing to ask, does my enemy have a need that I could contribute toward? It would be quite something to sit at any table with my enemy, but to have him come sit at my table? I'm sorry, that's just like over the top. That's where I draw the line, Jesus. This is too much for me. This is more than I can handle. Pursue hospitality. Bless those who are pursuing me to hurt me. But God has a method to his madness. Can't pray for someone and stay long, stay, stay mad at him very long. And it's hard to interact with someone socially and not begin to feel compassion for that person. You just sit with someone as you hear his story, as you hear her story, compassion begins to grow in your heart. And, and isn't that just what Jesus did? Although we were God's enemies, the Bible says, Jesus put on a body of human flesh. He left the splendor of heaven and he came to earth and he ate with us. Sometimes at posh dinner parties, sometimes at a wedding reception, sometimes it was a picnic on the beach. On one occasion, he just threw together a last minute soiree for 5,000 of his closest friends, but he ate with us. He pursued hospitality for us while we were pursuing him to death on a cross. And he blessed us. And he said, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Let me finish with an experience that I had almost 20 years ago when we were applying to build the first building. We had this property under contract and there was a, 
uh, tenant on the property, a landscaper who didn't want to lose. He was unhappy that we were trying to buy this land. He didn't want to lose his place of business. He, he had tried to buy this property, but he couldn't get the cash together to buy it. So when it came time for our zoning hearing, he wrote a smear letter about our church and he distributed it all over Greenwich. The letter said that we were a cult and that we were planning to build some creepy David Koresh kind of commune here on this property. In response to that, a group of neighbors came to the zoning hearing to oppose the church. And one man in particular was very vocal and he was very unflattering about harvest time, although he had never met us and had no idea who we were. We had a $150,000 deposit on this property and we invested $100,000 in fees to architects and engineers, civil engineers, uh, environmental studies, over $100,000. So we, we had $250,000 of God's money riding on the line on this hearing. We had a little Italian grandma in our congregation at the time. She was four foot eleven. I call her my little prayer warrior. She was in the back with a bunch of other intercessors praying, only she didn't know how to whisper. So every time someone got up to speak against the church, she started praying in tongues loudly. Our attorney, after the third or fourth person got up, and she would burst out again in tongues. Our attorney looked over at me and he said, what is that? <laughs> and I looked back at him and I said, you don't want to know. <laughs> we were there till about one o'clock in the morning and at the end of the night, the Greenwich Zoning Commission unanimously approved phase one and phase two. But the very next morning, I, I, dunked in, uh, I, I ducked into Dunkin' Donuts for a cup of coffee, and I ran face to face with the man who had been so vocal. And I didn't know what to say to him, and he didn't know what to say to me. I wanted to say to him, repent, you heathen. <laughs> but I managed to get out, hey, I meet you in all the best places. And he started laughing. After that, it, it seemed like I met him at Duncan. Never noticed him before, but it seemed like I met him two, three, four mornings a week. I would see him there. Sometimes he was sitting down. I, I go over to the table and just greet him. Never long. I'd just say, hey, how you doing? And it happened one morning that we were in line together. He was just behind me, so I paid for his coffee. You know, every morning after that, he was behind me in that line. I bought that guy so much coffee could have bought a tree for, for the property. Finally, one morning I came in, and he was sitting down, and I went over to greet him like I always did. He said, Pastor, he said, I'm not doing so well. I just found out that I have cancer. And I got to lay my hands on him right there in the middle of the Dunkin' Donuts and pray for him in the name of Jesus. A little while after that, the Northwest Greenwich Homeowners Association asked if they could use our old sanctuary for their annual meeting. And I'll never forget, in through the back door came my friend from Dunkin' Donuts. He was a little frail already. Cancer was kind of taking its toll on his body. But I remember he stopped in the back door and he was kind of captured a little bit when he looked in and saw the sanctuary and the altar. And I went over to greet him and he said, Pastor... He said, this is a beautiful church, and you are beautiful people. You know, a little while after that, we applied. We had to reapply for zoning for this building. We enlarged it. We added a basement under the whole thing and made some changes, so we had to apply for rezoning. Do you know there was not one person who came to speak in opposition of our church. Biggest church building in Greenwich, Connecticut. Second largest auditorium of any kind in this city. And not one person came to speak against us. You see, our enemies became friends. 
and we showed them the love of Jesus. Do you know what the Northwest Greenwich Homeowners Association called us a few weeks ago and they asked, can we hold all of our meetings in your new building from here on out? So we're just a blessing to the community and a place that they can come and meet and they can come and rally. Listen, I, I know that many of us have enemies in our lives that pose a far greater threat to us than a contentious neighbor. But if we will love them and leave the results to God, he will always cause us to triumph in the end. Love your enemies. Pray for them. Pull back when you want to punch back and pursue those who are pursuing you to show them kindness. Would you stand on your feet and give Jesus, the King of kings and Lord of lords, a great big praise in this place today.